Good evening, everyone. My name is Connor Moran. I'm the director of the Wisconsin Book Festival. Thank you so much for being here tonight um, to celebrate Emily Temple's debut novel, The Lightness. Um, I don't know about all of you, but I read debuts more than I read any other um, subset of fiction. And so um, it's always a wonderful thing to find a new great book to love and a new author to follow. So um, we couldn't be more delighted to have Emily here with us tonight. Um, as always, I wanna thank the Madison Public Library um, and the Madison Public Library Foundation for their unwavering support of the Wisconsin Book Festival. Since we went uh, to quarantine on St. Patrick's Day, they have been absolutely stalwart in saying how important it is to have free cultural events keep going in 2020. Um, events like tonight that I would love to be doing in person, but um, you know, we're going to do it virtually. I think we're, as Emily just said to me backstage, we are one of three virtual events. So it's really um, touching and personal and, and wonderful to have her. Um, it is also absolutely a uh, pleasure to be hosting Chloe Benjamin as the moderator this evening. Chloe, um, as many of you may know, is a Madison author um, and has been a huge supporter of the festival for a very long time. Um, going back, she's done workshops for us. She's done moderated conversations like this and done her own um, book events. So it is wonderful to have Chloe. Um, Emily Temple is a uh, debut fiction author tonight, um, but her fiction has appeared in many, many places across the internet. Electric Literature's Recommended Reading, Fairy Tale Review, Colorado Review, Indiana Review. Um, many of you may know her like I do um, as a senior fiction editor um, for LitHub. If you don't subscribe to LitHub already, um, you absolutely should. You will learn more in one day from the LitHub daily email about all things literary than you will um, just, you know, trying to find it yourself. Um, so with that, I'd like to welcome Emily and Chloe to the screen and let them take it away. Hi everyone, thank you so much, Connor, and thank you to Emily for being here, um, to Emily's publisher, William Morrow, and the Wisconsin Book Fest and the Madison Public Library Foundation. We are so delighted to be here, and um, I'm really excited to see you, Emily. I'm excited to see you too, and yes, I echo Chloe's thanks to all, and thanks for that LitHub plug. <laughs> yeah, and I, I thoroughly agree. Um, so I thought that I would just give you guys an overview of how tonight is going to go. Um, Emily will do a bit of reading. We will discuss The Lightness, her fantastic debut. Um, and then we'll have about 20 or 30 minutes for a Q&A. So there's an ask a question function um, down at the bottom of the screen. So if you want to put a question there, you can also apparently vote on questions that you want answered. This is my first time using Crowdcast, so it's very exciting. Um, and if you leave your question in the chat, that's okay too, Connor will move it. Um, the other thing I want to say is that this will be a spoiler free discussion. So if you haven't read the book, um, you're welcome to be here and make sure you read it. So um, Emily, take it away. Thanks, Chloe. Um, I'm so happy to be here and I'm so glad that all of you are here and taking time out of your busy days or your days of being on the couch and feeling sad about quarantine, whichever is true for you. I know it, there's a broad spectrum of experience out there. Um, okay, so I'm just gonna tell you a little bit about the book and then I will read a very short amount, six and a half minutes only. I timed it. Um, <laughs> yes. Uh, so The Lightness, uh, is a book about a young woman who follows her father to a meditation center in the mountains after he has been missing for a year. The meditation center is the last place that she knew he went. And so she goes seeking him and there she doesn't find him, not really a spoiler, but she does find a group of mysterious girls who are determined that they're going to figure out how to levitate by any means necessary, which if it sounds far-fetched, they are teenagers and they do their best. Uh, Chloe Benjamin wrote a beautiful blurb for this book and for that, I thank her so much. It's all true. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm just gonna read a little bit from the beginning and there, I will skip, 
I will skip a couple pages at a certain point, but it's still gonna be the beginning. I just can't help, but I have to read my favorite section for you. So um, here we go. The man who drove me up the mountain in the first month of my 16th summer looked nothing like my father. He had thick black hair, a thick red neck, and a rosary wrapped around his rear view mirror. But instead of a cross, a miniature naked woman whose breast seemed not quite to scale dangled from the coil of synthetic beads. She bobbed in the flow of the air vents, twisted and slapped two-dimensionally against the cheap black cab plastic, and I was reminded, again, of the shapes of women, the impossible geometry into which I was meant to fold myself. I couldn't look at her for long. Not because of my own monstrous reflection, which I kept catching in the rear view, also not quite to scale, I thought, but because my stomach was weak in those days. Whenever the car hit a quick dip or banked a long curve, it felt as though parts of my body, throat, liver, one thick thigh, were left hovering, separated, while the rest plummeted or swerved or bumped or whatever. It was a long drive, our trajectory relentless. Even approaching the levitation center is an exercise in anti-gravity, people used to say, and it's true. The center was high enough in the mountains that I felt the air thin out long before I ever, I even saw the main building with its paper white stucco walls, its red tipped roof, its enormous golden seal. The atmosphere loosened steadily as we drove. I could feel all that nice thick sea level air pooling at my ankles and then abandoning me, even through the churn of the air conditioning. In the end, I spent most of the ride staring at an amoebic mole in the back of the cab driver's neck. That was my mother's wisdom. To combat motion sickness, look unwaveringly at something inside the car, something small and still if decidedly cancerous, dark purple, spreading out at the edges, no matter. Say nothing, try not to move your eyes. I know a lot of people who can't remember themselves as teenagers. They look back and see only smoother, pinker versions of themselves. The actual feeling of those frantic years replaced by anecdote and snapshot. Oh look, weren't we babies? Weren't we thin? Remember the time we, etc. We were so bad, we weren't so bad. Who can say? Me, I can't forget. I remember the girl from that summer as though she were sitting beside me, a fearful girl, but insatiable too, possessed of a fundamental savagery. Well, can we blame her? It had only been a year since her father had disappeared. As soon as I became, as soon as I started to become nihilistic about my nausea, the cab crested through a final bend and pulled into a white sand driveway the size of a swimming pool. A woman was waiting there, wearing a white dress. She introduced herself as Magda and took my hand as though she knew me. For a moment, I tried to pull away, but she held on tight and I was unsteady enough in the thin air that I let her. By now, we were almost 8,000 feet up. I was late, Magda told me. I was the last, the very last to arrive. She led me across the driveway towards the center's main building, paths lined with globular pink peonies scribbled out in the grass to either side, but we didn't follow any of them. Instead, we strode, hands linked across the white expanse. The duffel bag on my shoulder felt heavy, much heavier than I remembered, and I wondered briefly if someone could have hidden something inside of it at the airport when I wasn't paying attention, a hard-packed pallet of powder, say, or a recording device, or the body of a small child. No, no, don't be silly. That's not what this story is about, isn't it? Magda began talking, pointing out all the different buildings, the different trails, listing the daily activities, the times I'd be expected for meditation and meals. I couldn't follow any of it. Commissary, dormitory, promontory, bedtime story. I stumbled on a bright white rock. It sparked across the sand like a popping kernel. Mond only tightened her grip. She gave an overall impression of linen and salt. They say everyone faints at least once during their first week at the center before they acclimate to the altitude. Altitude is a perfect word for itself, don't you think? All peaks and valleys and places to slip. But I'd been drinking steadily from my battered canteen the one my father had given me years before at a place very much like this one, and so I didn't fall. Besides, I was busy looking back over my shoulder. Back over my shoulder, the wind had caught in the loose white sand of the driveway and was coaxing it upwards into a steamy funnel. A group of strange looking girls who had clearly been installed at the center long enough for their heads to become utterly untethered from the old brown world down below appeared as if from nowhere. They yipped and laughed and took turns running through the snow white mini twister, holding hands, shrieking like children at a water park, coming out the other side with thick white eyebrows and heavy white eyelashes and red sand scratched cheeks and instant aging. Magda turned and called out to them 
And after a few more furtive loops and peels, they ran past us towards the main building, sand streaming off their bodies like water. So the girls at the center were trouble. I knew that going in. They were slick Finnish girls, cat eye girls, hot blood girls. They were girls who reveled. They were girls who liked boys in back seats, who slid things that weren't theirs into their tight pockets, who lit fires and did donuts in the high school parking lot. They were girls who left marks. They were girls who snuck. Girls who drank whiskey and worse by the waterfront, looking out at the smeared reflections of the streetlights, making plans instead of wishes. They were girls who ran away, who inked their own arms with needles and ballpoint pens, who got things pierced below the neck. Below the neck, ladies, can you believe it? Only whores, et cetera, et cetera, as my mother never tired of telling me. They pierced two these girls and hit and were sent out of gym class for raising bruises on the girls whose daddies brought them to school in Porsches, though some of their daddies had Porsches too. That wasn't the point. That wasn't the point. They had their problems. They had their demands. They were shoplifters and potheads, arsonists and bullies, boy crazy and girl crazy, split and scarred. They were, some of them, cruel. They were, more of them, angry. Angry at their parents, at their schools, at their congressmen, at their bodies, at the painted white lines they saw everywhere, telling them no, 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 when they wanted yes. They were girls who were bored, so bored. Or they were girls who were the opposite, who were so full up of feeling that they couldn't simply do their times tables or learn their French conjugations or go to the movies on a Saturday night and discuss the relative cuteness of so-and-so's haircut and let the age-appropriate boy next to them drag his sweaty palm around and around and around their knees. They were too full up for that. They were too full up for caution. So they were girls who got caught and they were girls who got sent away. They were girls whose mothers couldn't deal with them for one more minute, not alone, not without help, not this summer while you sit in the office all day and come home late after golf, Carl, really, I can't. Girls whose fathers thought maybe some good clean mountain air and some good far Eastern religion would cure them since nothing else had. You know the girls, I mean, because every school has them, every neighborhood, including yours, especially mine. I was not one of them, of course, not yet. Well, thank you so much, Emily. I love that section um, in the book and I love hearing it read. I think one of the things that it it reminds me is just the electricity of your language. I think Emily is a writer who loves language and who loves playing with it and, um, and the writing just sizzles and you'll see that um, on the page as well. And I see some clap hand emojis in the, uh, in the chat, so others agree. Um, so let's launch into talking about it. I wanted to start with a question that I have to say I struggle to answer myself because I feel like so much of it is subconscious, but it's also a question that I love to ask other writers because I'm genuinely curious. So with the caveat that you can just blame it on your subconscious, um, where did the inspiration come from for this book? What was the initial spark of an idea and did that change over time? So as you say, I am a writer who's interested in language and this book actually started as a little joke that I made to myself in my head. Uh, I mean, I, if I'm gonna be technical about it, it started as a short story. I knew I wanted to set a book in this place at a meditation center like the one that I had gone to when I was a kid, though mine was not full of bad girls. It was just full of regular Buddhists. Um, <laughs> but I was, I was, I remember thinking about the place and thinking meditation center and then thinking, oh, levitation center, ha ha ha, that's a joke. Not a good one, but it was, a play on words in my mind, I was just turning over. And then I started thinking about it and thinking about how you might become obsessed with that idea at a certain age. And so the first, the first short story that I wrote set at this place wasn't, didn't have anything to do with levitation. Mm. But as I started working through it, that little that phrase just kept, coming back to me and I thought, well, let me try. Like, you know, 
we'll see, we'll see how far they get. And I ended up doing so much research into levitation and and thinking about it a lot. It became a big part of the book, accidentally. Yeah, I, I wanna come back to the levitation because that's something that I'm really curious about. But just to, to stay with the, um, the writing process for now. So I love to hear you talk about how kind of the initial idea didn't have that component or didn't have that component in the same way. And then the levitation component sort of grew in your, in your mind or in the novel. Um, and so from, from the point that you started writing the book um, to now, I'm curious if you can talk a bit about that process, given that I know you are somebody who, as Connor said, works in the publishing industry. So you have a day job in publishing and you write uh, online. And then you've also had to fit in working on this book over the years. And I know that you also have an MFA. So I don't know if you started this book at the MFA or afterward, but can you kind of take us through, okay, we have the idea. What's What was the rest of the journey like and how have you balanced it with the other things on your plate at that time, at those times? Yeah, I mean, writing a book is hard for anyone. It is much harder than I thought it would be as someone who has been writing about books on the internet for uh, over a decade at this point. Um, but yes, I started it, so I started it in grad school. And that first short story that I wrote that was set at the center or what would become the center, the characters were the same, but they had different names. Um, I think that the narrator's name was Megan and Serena's name was Daisy, which I thought was like a really like hippie name. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so it was at the suggestion of my advisor, my MFA advisor, the novelist Jan Allison, that I even tried to turn it into a novel. She kind of gave me the, you know, we had this meeting in the fall of my second year and she said, so what are you thinking for your thesis? And I told her, oh, I'll, I'll probably do short stories. And she sort of gave me a like, are you sure you wanna do that? Don't you have an idea for a novel? Wouldn't you like to write a novel this year? And I sort of said, okay, Jane, I'll try. And <laughs> she gave me this, like, she, she just looked at me and she said, oh, you'll try, will you try? <laughs> very you know and I was like okay yes Jane I will do it I I worship her so of course I, yeah. I was like I will do everything anything you say and she pointed out to me that um it, it's not very usual most writers don't get the opportunity I was very lucky to have someone who is going to be there with you while mm -hmm. you write that first draft mm -hmm. of your novel and she said you should just take advantage of this that you have yeah. here and so I did from in the very first draft of this novel was my thesis for the MFA, but it was um, very different. It was uh, about half as long and has some of the same beats, similar beginning and ending, but just almost nothing of that draft is still in the book. Mm. Just to just for context on how much it has changed. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, so then I left the MFA and I basically worked on it continuously through moving to New York, getting a job at Lit Hub, and then I would get up at 6 a.m. and work on it in the morning and then leave for work at 9 every day and then work until noon on the weekends. Um which was, and, and, and go to bed at 10 p.m. Just <laughs> so have, I did not have that much of a social life. Um, so yeah, I just, it was, it was really, I will say it was really helpful for me to have that first beginning to end draft because I think if I had left the MFA with just a vague idea, I wouldn't have been able to stick to it and keep coming back to it in the way that I did. It was it really helped to, to at least have something that felt like a whole thing. Yeah, that's amazing. And I, I really appreciate how detailed you were about your schedule and sort of 
how how you fit it in because I think it's really a question for people who work full time um, or part time. And the reality is that most writers have another job, if not other jobs, plural. Um, and so we all find ways to fit it in differently, but it takes a lot of motivation. And I wonder if if you could speak to like, what was it? Do you feel that that the motivation that you had to get up that early every day and to, you know, put your social life second, etc. Was that just intrinsic? Was that because you loved this book? Like what? I think people might be interested in hearing how do you maintain that kind of disciplined practice? Well, I am a grade grubbing, um, like nerdy, goody two shoes type of person. And so what I need is a deadline. And I need to know that someone is waiting for my work that well I don't need that but it really helps me so I mean this is why it I was able to write that first draft in the MFA because I thought All right, I gotta write it or I'm gonna fail the MFA right Who fails the MFA it's hard <laughs> <laughs> but if you don't yeah. if you don't do your thesis then you will fail um so I was lucky enough that when I was at UVA an agent came and read the first 25 pages and said like okay, um, send this to me when you're done. And so from that point, I had someone on the other side mm. who cared, even if at the beginning it was only a little bit, whether mm. or not I ever sent her something. And that was really motivating for me. And then in order to sort of bridge the gap between that nebulous idea and the actual getting up at six every morning, I just had a goal every day when I was writing when I needed to create, it would be 500 words a day. Mm -hmm. And then when I was editing, it would be section by section. Mm -hmm. And I would say, you know, you're going to have to get to this point by this day. And I would write it down so that I could give myself an A plus or not at the end mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> when I decided whether I deserved it. So, I mean, it really, I'm sort of jealous of people who wake up and feel that they just have to write, that they have to get it out, that mm -hmm. they, you know, want to share their insides with the world. I feel that way sometimes, but mostly it's a discipline technique. Mm -hmm. It's it's mostly I get up and I would rather just read my book in bed. I I would rather just, you know, do something else and it's a matter of looking at my schedule and thinking, well, you gotta, you gotta get an A plus. Yeah, no, that is, that is so true. I think people don't always realize that those of us who write don't simply come to the desk because we're in a moment of inspiration, but like it is labor, it is a practice and it's a muscle that you exercise. Um, so that's really, really fascinating. Um, I see a question about revision and i also had a question about revision so maybe we'll talk about that and then we can move more into the novel and its themes yeah um so i've read a few drafts of this novel we i'm lucky enough to be friends with you and to have seen it um grow over the years and change and i really admire how open you have been to editorial feedback i know that with your agent you worked for a few years um if i recall just on ed editing it before you sent it to publishers sorry that's my cat she's trying to get in the room oh, she'll make it um so <laughs> you could just see the tail um so i know you worked for years with your agent and then for people who don't know once your book sells to a publishing house you do revisions with your editor. Uh, so it's a very long period in which you're continually going back to that manuscript and making changes. Um, revision is difficult for many of us, probably most of us or all of us who are writers. Um, so I'm wondering, like, can you talk about the process of receiving and deciding whether or not to incorporate editorial feedback? Um, like what calculus do you use when you decide um, yeah, you know, that's a great point. I'm going to work that in. Or actually, I want to push back there. Yeah, it's tough. I, I 
one of the things that is so funny about novel writing is that we all treat it as though it's just one person and they're locked into a room and when they come out they have this perfect whole novel and wow genius but that's not it at all and i was um surprised writing with my first novel to see how it was collaboration and how i would get input from these you know not only my agent and, and yeah we worked on it for two years um and then my editor and then i also got input from my uk editor mm -hmm. so there was a lot of smart women telling me stuff <laughs> which i always love um, <laughs> But there was, so the way that I would approach it is some things you hear and you think instantly, yes, very good idea. I'm gonna do that. Mm -hmm. Some things you you hear and you think, I don't know, do I have to? That seems mm -hmm. not what I wanted or hard or it's a lot, whatever it is. And my process, especially when working with my agent was I, would think about it for a while. I took would take really intense notes when we would have these our conversations about it. And then I would just think about it and try to see what a few days later, what I would remember from that conversation, what would stick out to me. And it was usually like two things. Hmm. Um, and then I would, I would decide that those were either the very good or very bad ideas. And so I would look, I would, think about them and then I would look at all my notes and, and et cetera. Um, but the thing that I t told myself was, and was just try it. You can just try it. Just open a new, a new version and just try it in a new version. And you can leave the old one as it is. And it, you don't, it's still beautiful, but just try it in this new version. Yeah, I, I just have to say, I love that. And I would totally need a new word doc because I would be like, I cannot contaminate mm -hmm. the one with like this idea that I'm a little on the fence about. Mm -hmm. or, so like, that's such a small thing, but I feel like it's the sort of thing that like so a writer will share with another writer and you'll be like, that's an incredible idea. Open a new document blank. You can delete it if you don't like it or you can plug it in. Yeah, and it's like you can you you can pretty pretty quickly you'll figure out whether you miss the old version or you're happy in the new version. Interesting. I I found that that would be pretty intuitive. There was also I will admit that there were times my agent would say give me a a note and I would be like hmm, okay and then I would decide privately I'm not going to do that and yeah. then the next time she would give me the same note and I would be like. I'm not gonna do that. And the third time she would give me the same note and then I would try it and it would always be brilliant. And I was always like, oh, oh wow. That's like, that's amazing though, that that's true. Like you you have a great partnership with with your agent. Yeah, she well, she's incredible. She's she's a very, very good reader and editor. So I was just lucky in that way. I know a lot of agents aren't that editorial, mm -hmm. um, but I, I also sent it to her when it was very early. It had been my MFA thesis and then maybe another draft. So it was, there was a lot, there was a lot to work with. Um, but I just, I think it is, do you, so do you have a hundred different drafts of your novels on your computer? No, I have one main document and that is like the, like golden egg that I try to like tell myself will need no work and has been perfected. Mm -hmm. And of course then like it changes drastically every single time. Um, and I, so every day I kind of start by revising what I did the day before. And if I feel like I need to take a different direction, something that's more major, I would, I guess I would just save as and start a new draft. We're getting really granular guys for, for anyone. Save as is a great trick. Mm -hmm, yes. Um, yeah. But I, but it would like be otherwise the, the stuff I didn't want would be pulled out and dropped into like a graveyard document. So I still had it, but it wasn't in the draft that I work with. Does that make sense? Yes. I do the same thing. I have a graveyard doc and I recently, 
I looked at my graveyard doc for the like I, I have a I have a different graveyard doc for every version for every version. Oh. So this is like a sick. I'm sorry, and I'll stop in just one second. But I added them all up to and my graveyard docs are three times the length of my novel. Oh my god! So there is a lot that gets that's amazing. <laughs> yeah. But that's, I think that's really important for people to hear that there is so much that winds up on the cutting room floor, as they say. And I, um, th this is just one example that's coming to mind, but I, I know that Donna Tart mentioned that she worked for nine months on a subplot that just wound up being completely deleted. And I mean, nine months is bad. It could obviously be a lot worse, but you know, ev every writer goes through this kind of continual, like taking out the trash even though that's a like weird way to put it taking out your beautiful precious trash yeah, into its own special word document where we can save mm -hmm. it forever you can still look at but i will say that when after um after we i sold the book and i was in edit edits then with my editor there were two sections that i missed that i thought about and then i thought like mm. i cut this and i really need it I want it. I want it back. And I just slipped them back in there. And Thank you know, God, you had box. exactly. I had that graveyard. I went into the graveyard. Yeah. I, like, I remember this. I, I'm, I'm still, so again, it's like in the same way as the editing process, I would think about which notes I was still thinking about after mm -hmm. a few days, the same thing with cutting. I, if, if I cut something, I would think, you know what, you can always put it back in. If you think right. about it, it's like, you know, when you see a pair of shoes on the internet and you think, I really want those shoes. And then do you really want them? Will you still want them in a week? Will you still be thinking about them? Right. Maybe not. You know, right. you are, you should buy them. Right. <laughs> but revisions are never sold out. Um, <laughs> True. <laughs> that, thank you for sharing that. I feel like if anybody else is as interested as we are in Talking Craft, like join us at some other virtual event yeah. where we can do that for three hours. Um, but. To come back to your book, the novel brings together some really interesting and seemingly disparate themes. And I think none more so than Buddhism and American teenage girlhood. Um, so I was wondering if you could tell us about your interest in Buddhism and what it was like to layer that concept and history on top of your quartet of teenage girls. So I, as I uh, mentioned, I think um, my Family was Buddhist, is Buddhist. Um, my father was a student of the same Tibetan teacher who was the teacher of the Beats, Jack Kerouac and Ginsburg. And we used to go to this meditation center in Vermont every summer to hear another teacher's lecture, or my parents would, would go to these lectures and I would sort of be relegated to whatever the kids were doing. Um, and so there was, it's sort of, I sort of, I drew from my own experience growing up with Buddhism in my life for the character of Olivia, mm -hmm. who is sort of, she's a little bit more torn between her parents than I ever was, but she has this, a connection to it, but she's not exactly sure what it is and what her connection to it is. I grew up similarly in that it was all around me and it was always around me and I knew a lot about it, but I had never studied it formally. And so it was a lot of osmosis that I had, mm -hmm. I had taken in, those things that I had taken in. So actually when we got close to the end um, with edits, I sent, I cut out all the stuff that had to do with Buddhism and I sent it to my dad to make sure that I was factually correct mm -hmm. in everything that I was saying because I've never taken a class on it, but I've, I've lived through a lot of it. So I think Buddhism is pretty fascinating. Um, it has a strong literary tradition and mm -hmm. I wanted, I, and I think that it fits in at least in the ways that I'm highlighting with that so many of the central concerns of being a teenage girl, you have this, I mean, the main one being want, that mm -hmm. you just have this 
I mean, maybe I'm giving too much away about my my teenage years here, but you have this like empty pit of wanting and it's un, it's sort of unfocused and it's in all directions. And that's one of the main things that Buddhism is trying to address, is trying to say to you, desire is the root of all suffering. Uh, they're wanting things to be other than they are is why we're unhappy. And if you think about it, you know, I, I still think that that holds water as an idea. Um, I mean, just think about being in the pandemic. Um, so I, there was a naturalistic pairing for me in the sense that I was a teenager who grew up with Buddhism. And so, and so I wanted to write about that, you know, write about my, me crying that my hair, I had gotten a bad, gotten bad highlights and my father just saying, well, you know, everything's impermanent, you know? <laughs> and I was like, well, this does not help me right now. <laughs> Thank you for your concern. <laughs> um, so, I, so yeah, so it was a naturalistic pairing, but I also think that the, the two have some thematic connection. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. That really resonates for me. And I think the way that you describe that sort of state of, of want and of electricity that I talked about um, in the prose um, is, is in some ways a universal experience, just as I think many of Buddhism's teachings are utterly universal. Um, so let's go back to the idea of levitation. Um, we were emailing before this event and I asked if there were any things that you were interested in talking about and you threw out the idea of levitation and pop culture and I was like, tell me more. So um, you mentioned that levitation was kind of this growing interest or focus in the narrative. Um, can you talk a bit about that and and like the pop culture references and how, like, how did this idea sort of um, appear to you? I mean, this, this book is basically the product of a six year long rabbit hole. It's, it's, I just started Googling and looking and searching different portrayals of levitation and just find, I'm still finding them. Um, and I was fascinated by the ways that levitation is used in, in pop culture. And it's a lot, I mean, a lot of it is, it's the same. So, okay, so we have, I mean, to, to use a broad definition of pop culture, of course, you have religious levitations, which um, happen in Buddhism and Christianity. Um, you know, St. Teresa, you have St. Joseph, Cupertino, who, you know, the patron saint of, ba of, of bad students taking difficult tests. <laughs> was also a levitator. Why? I love it. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you have, you know, plenty of monks, but then you also have levitation as two, two main things, which are related. Um, one, a symbol of power, just catch all when you have power, especially when you've just been infused with power, mm -hmm. it's just levitation. Like that's, a sort of shorthand for power. So think of Storm in the X-Men just basically raising her arms and you see the lightning flash and she just goes straight upwards. Think about all these witches, you know, who start by levitating that pencil, showing that, mm -hmm. that pencil. Think about, you know, seeing an object of power on a pedestal and it's just floating above the pedestal. And you know that that means that that is this special item. Mm -hmm. And then you have levitation as sexual ecstasy. So mm -hmm. think about the most chaste version at the end of Casper, when Christina Ricci is dancing with Devin Sawa, who was a cartoon ghost for this whole movie. Now this, again, this is just my child, child of the eighties here. Um, she's been dancing, she's there's been ghost, a ghost the whole movie, and then he, just for one night, is a boy, and he's a very cute boy, and they're dancing, and they just rise off the floor, just a little bit, just rise off the floor. 
Um, you can also see in, in Buffy the Vampire Slayer, my favorite thing, uh, there are levitation sex scenes. There's also levitation sex scenes in Tarkovsky films. It's just this repeated image that I, once you start looking for it, you just start to see it everywhere. You can tell I'm like excitedly like, let me list you all the things that I found. Um, but so I just, it made me think. And the more that I found, the more I thought, why, what is this? Why do we want this? It's not because you think that we have this human desire to fly, right? That's sort of a something that people always talk about, that people want to fly. Humans want to fly because it's this thing we can't do physically. And levitation is sort of flying. Mm -hmm. It can be flying, but it's not quite flying. It's more limited. It's more specific. And it's just used as this shorthand. It's almost mm -hmm. never used for its own sake. It's almost never mm -hmm. like a plot point where it's where you need to levitate in order to get the special prize or whatever, however plot works. Um, it's, it's never for its own sake. It's always an indicator. Mm -hmm. And that I thought was really interesting in just thinking about you know, symbolism and how we process that. Mm -hmm. Sorry, that was a long-winded answer. No, it's super interesting. And I'm just thinking about this idea of levitation as a shorthand for power, as you were saying, and the other word that was coming to me was control. You yeah. know, if you see something levitate in a, in a movie or whatever, and, and very often you'll see like this look of intense concentration or sort of like rapture on the face of the person who is doing that to the object and the idea is that they have control over it in a way that defies the natural world. And uh, yeah. I think that, that desire for control is one of those things that is also um, pretty much universal to being a teenage girl because yeah. you know, you're know you coming sort of into adulthood in a society that um, that is very controlling of, of women and and girls. So, um, so kind of in the, in line with this, I think we have time for maybe one more question of mine and then we'll get to some of your questions. So if you have any, please, um, use the ask a question function or the chat function to, to ask us. Um, but another thing you said when we were emailing was so interesting to me, and I'm going to quote you to show everyone that you are a fascinating and brilliant mind so that they have no choice but to buy the book if they have not yet bought it. Um, as you guys might have noticed, there's this wonderful turquoise um, stripe button down here at the bottom of the screen. I sound like a grandmother. <laughs> um, so her, it says, purchase your copy of The Lightness from A Room of One's Own now. So that's awesome. A Room of One's Own is um, one of our local independent bookstores in Madison, and that button will take you there. Um, also, if you're outside of Madison, um, please consider supporting your local indie. Um, they are in need of love during this time, and uh, and it's just always a great thing to do. So what you wrote is maybe something you and I could talk about is writing basically realist novels that may or may not have one element of the fantastic in them. At least for me, both the lightness and the immortalists leave the door open to decide that there is magic or decide that there is not magic. Um, you also shared a story about an ex-boyfriend, <laughs> which I think is optional. Well, I'll leave that in your hands, whether or not to share here. Um, but I love this idea and I think that's so true that like you really um, articulate what feels like a sort of shared DNA there. Um, so talk about that, <laughs> please. Yeah, I mean, it's one of the things that I love so much about The Immortalist and which I'm sure that many of you here also love about The Immortalist. Um, if not, you too can use the button. <laughs> um, it's, it's, basically, it's basically a realist novel about siblings and how they respond to the suggestion of magic. So mm -hmm. if people don't know, at the beginning of Chloe's latest novel, um, four siblings are told the day that they're gonna die by a 
mysterious woman. It's like basically the the opening of a book that I've read that has made me most sure that I'm gonna love the whole book in my entire life. The only closest one is Helen Doe the Last Samurai, where you just read the prologue and you're like, oh yes, this book is amazing and it's for me. So, <laughs> I mean, it, it's brilliant. Um, but, you know, then it leaves the door open for all these questions of what does it mean for you to believe it? And what does it mean for you to not believe it? And I think that, and, and how, to what extent does believing it or not believing it actually affect your fate? And I think that, you know, similarly, this idea of levitation, a lot of it is around, are, do we believe it or do we not believe it? And without giving anything away, I think that the endings of both books leave it open for the reader to, yeah, either decide that there's magic or decide that there isn't magic. And I know, I mean, I want to hear what, what you have to say about this, but my, I want, I change my mind about that every day, just generally. Is there magic? Is there not magic? Um, some days I feel cynical. Some days I feel like, well, but you know, maybe. Um, and I think it like creates this interesting ambiguity and it sort of lets you have both at once, which yeah. is is really the thing that I like most about it. So I don't know, I mean, what do you, did you talk about that? <laughs> I know I, I love all of what you just said and the way that you described the book, um, you know, the, like you said something like um, it's it's not necessarily about the, this woman being um, prophetic, but it's about how the siblings respond to what they have heard and right. and all think. Um, and I feel the same way as you. I feel like, I mean, obviously I don't know whether there's magic in the world um, cause none of us do, but that's exactly what is so um, seductive and fascinating and like, and magnetic to me as um, everything that we don't know. You know, we know so much about our universe. It's kind of incredible um, what humans have been able to discover in, you know, however many thousands of years, but, at the same time, there's so very much that we have absolutely no idea about. And so I'm interested in religion and science as kind of alternate ways of approaching the unknown. Um, religion being one that sort of makes space for the unknown and honors that and science being one that sort of seeks to figure out. But that doesn't mean that the religious model or the idea of honoring the unknown is, is any less um, valid or um or uh like valid as a way of knowing or, mm -hmm. or finding out so um i also loved in your book that that sense of like will they or won't they and um and i won't give away what happens but i think for for people who are just interested in the sort of strange little undercurrents and corners of the world, those places um, that make us question, um, this is something that you'll love about this book. So um, we have about 10 minutes um, and let's see, I'm looking in the questions. Um, there's two votes for this top one. So it's clearly a, um, very popular one. So let's start with that. Um, it says your idea started with place, but as you're writing, are you focusing more on character or plot during the first draft? Where is your focus? Great question. So for me, plot is the hardest and it comes the least naturally to me. So for me in the first draft, I was focusing on plot just trying to get us from A to B to C because the place came very easily to me. The language comes pretty naturally to me. The characters, mm, certainly more naturally the plot. And so it helps me to do the heavy lifting at the outset and then tinker with everything else. Mm. And now I know a lot of people 
start with character and use the characters to drive the plot, which is also useful. I found that that started happening to me in later drafts that I would get deeper into the characters and then I would think, you know what? This can't be what she does here. It's gotta be someone else who does it or it can't happen at all. And it it's easier at least for me to erase and to rewrite. It's easier to do that than to start from zero. So mm -hmm. I, I like, I hate the blank page. I always want to have something. I'd rather edit one sentence into a <laughs> 300 page novel than write that one sentence. <laughs> <laughs> That's so interesting because it is so, I think that is so varied and, and personal. And I have friends who like you, you know, for their first draft, it's sort of setting up like, what's the story? What's the arc? And it, and does this sort of stand up on its own? Yeah. And then you think more about the people and um, there's, there's infinite ways of approaching it. So I think, you know, I, I I'm always fascinated to hear from fellow writers, what they, what they think about that. Um, so somebody else asked, um, I'm always looking for crossover books that work for both adults and teens. Do you consider your novel a crossover like this? And the person hasn't read it yet. I think it could be a crossover for smart teens. Um, there's some, Mm, I mean, it depends on if you want your teens to know about sex and drugs and stuff and swear words. Um, Maybe but, give it a read first if those yeah. things, yeah. But I do think that it would be something that teenagers would relate to. I mean, I certainly would have loved a novel like this. <laughs> Pam says they know about sex and drugs. <laughs> Great. Yeah, this book isn't gonna. I, I don't think this is the book that's gonna like pull the wool from. It's not gonna house. tell them anything they don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I so I know some people want to be careful what they give to their kids. That's, so I'm yeah. just caveating that I'm not. I'm not. It's PG thirteen. <laughs> but yeah, I I definitely think so. I think. I mean, one of the reasons that I wanted to write this book in this way is that I think we need to give teenagers more credit, actually, that they should be, you know, I, I read Lolita as a teenager and I thought, wow, every sentence in this book is a masterpiece. Mm -hmm. um, and just, I just had the thought of, speaking of editing, I remember my mother challenging me once and saying, if you cut one word out of Lolita, would it still be Lolita? And I said, yes, like the somewhere, one the somewhere. And she said, okay, what about a sentence? What about 10 sentences? And I've always thought that that was such a brilliant way to think about, you know, what is essential to a novel. And this is a side, total sidetrack from this question. Um, but just in terms of editing, thinking about at what point is the novel not the novel anymore? And maybe there is no point where that's true. Yeah. Yeah. I think the, that's a really fascinating question, especially when you get to line edits, you know, so yeah. for those who don't know, line edits are basically um, on the sentence level. So your editor crossing out a word or adding an S or saying, you know, can you expand in this clause or whatever? And those are different from the bigger picture structural edits. So this actually segues perfectly into a question um, that is from Laura. How often do you wrestle with your book on the sentence level? You said language comes easily, but how often do you fight yourself? Oh, all the time. I mean, just the part that I read at the beginning, I changed two sentences while I read it. Oh, um, really? Just yeah. There, well, no, no. I mean, I, when I, I see that they are wrong because uh, one is a fight that I lost with a copy editor and yeah. one is I changed my mind. Um, and so it's very small, just very yeah. small things within the sentence. But I think, especially when reading it aloud, you see what the 
pattern is and what the sound is. And that's really important to me in terms of sentences. I mean, I will say that it, it really depends on the sentence. Um, there are sentences in this book that came down to me from the sky, perfectly formed, that never changed. And I, uh, and some sentences that I fought for because they don't actually make literal sense, but I think they make sound sense. Hmm. And so I just was like, these must stay in here. And um, my very lovely editor let me have them her she always said you know if you can make a case for it then you can keep it if you don't <laughs> want it to have it then maybe we'll talk about it <laughs> awesome. um but yeah so and then so some just came to me fully formed and they've stayed forever some have required tinkering and tinkering and tinkering and now this is the work that i really love to do um because even though it takes work it doesn't feel like plot to me feels like carrying bags of sand across the you know across the road um tinkering with sentences feels like touching up a painting mm -hmm. um so the way that i would do it would be that um every time i read through the draft i would just mark anything that i thought was lazy is lazy or this is a is is a boring sentence it's a plain sentence i mean sometimes you plainness is there for a reason um but i wanted at least every paragraph to have something beautiful in it mm -hmm. and so i would just mark the la lazy stuff and it would often be getting a character from a to b and then i would go back and i would just look at that one paragraph and try to make it sing in some way mm -hmm. and it could be a, it could be simple it doesn't always have to be like a beautiful flowery phrase. Um, and it might be taking something out, but I always, I, I just never wanted to leave anything that I knew where I knew I could do better. Okay. That's amazing. That's, in, that's actually really inspiring. Like that makes me want to apply that idea of kind of, can I have something that's like a jewel in, in every paragraph? Um, so yeah, you're like a wealth of novel writing information. Um, I just made it up. <laughs> it sounds- We all do. <laughs> fascinating and wonderful. Um, so let's do one more. We have just a couple minutes. Um, let me see if, Emily, is there one that um, you see in here that is singing to you? Or would you like me to- pick well why don't we answer this this question that's for both of us here okay um so the question says for both of you is it about the possibility of magic but also how people respond to the magic i mean those are almost the same thing i, I would say that mm -hmm. that there is something I mean, magic, well, if I'm going to get like really big picture about it, magic is only what we think it is. I mean, mm -hmm. the, there's that saying that it, science is just magic. No, it's magic is science that you haven't figured out yet. Something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. um, I think that I'm, I'm personally fascinated by how people, whether people believe in magic or not, how they negotiate the idea of magic. I mean, that I guess is even more interesting than is it is it possible for them to levitate? Like that's mm -hmm. an interesting question, but what's much more interesting is how far will they go mm -hmm. to levitate? One of the things I wrote in my in my notes, and I recently rediscovered this, um, and I wrote it all in like big letters across my notes in my, in my little notebook was, uh, what do we believe and how far will we go to believe it? Mm -hmm. And I think that's like a central question for this book. And I think it's a central question for the immortalists. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I was going to say in response to the question, yes, I think that's exactly it. It's 
How do people respond to what they feel is magic or, or what they believe is magic or what they don't believe is magic? I think, you know, belief and and or faith are like it's 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 there or it's not. And um, and it, you know, as as you said earlier, what we believe, how far we'll go, we'll go to keep believing in it um, to to justify our lives to ourselves or to understand our lives um, is as fascinating, if not more interesting as, you know, is, you know, in my book, for instance, is Clara really hearing her brother knocking um, or not? Um, so I think that they're, in, as you're saying, they're inextricab inextricably linked. Yeah. Well, hopefully that's a cliffhangery place to end. Um, thank you all so much for being here with us. It's so um, awesome that you guys have taken the time in this virtual landscape to come to an event like this. Um, I'm so excited for you guys to read this book. Um, I just wanna mention again, you can just click to order the turquoise button at the bottom of the screen or call into your local indie. Um, and one thing that we didn't get to um, in terms of my questions, but which you can go to Emily's Instagram um, for is to see some of the um, parent books of the likeness. So Emily did a um, Mother's Day and Father's Day post that have um, the, mo the moms and dads of her book. Um, and so I just want to plug that. And that's at no known Emily, K-N-O-W-N-E-M-I-L-Y. Yes. So I've never had my Instagram plugged before. Yeah. I just, I just had to put it in there. It's a, it's a good Instagram. Thanks. Um, yeah, just want to say thank you to everyone. It was so great to have you here. I hope you enjoyed our conversation and thank you so much, Chloe, for your brilliant questions. And I will also reiterate, I'm sure everyone has already read her mega best-selling beautiful novel. Um, but I'll also side plug for the anatomy of dreams, which is very good. <laughs> with thank debut, you. Which you, I are, you are an early person who is very kind to that book and that means a lot. Um, <laughs> honor, I, you? Read it. <laughs> I just want to say thank you to you, Chloe, for moderating tonight's uh, event. And Emily, thank you so much for this book. Thank you for being here and taking the time. I know um, you're not doing a lot of virtual events and so we're really honored to, to be one. And um, I put another plug for Lit Hub in there. Emily writes great things all the time and keeps us surprised of what's going on. Um, she'll also let us know all the great things that are going to be published for the rest of the year in just, what, a couple, a week, a couple days? Oh, well, two weeks. <laughs> we'll have it in August. So just check it out. We'll have it. Wonderful. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you for being here tonight. Um, next week, uh, Monday, we have Christina Clancy for her debut novel, The, Sec uh, the Summer Home, and um, we hope to see you again soon. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thanks for joining us.